The NES Top Loader is a fantastic retro video game system. It addresses a lot of the issues that the toaster had, the front loader, where it's just, it reads games more precisely, more accurately. You don't have a lot of the blinking light, well, you don't have any blinking light issues because this doesn't have a blinking light on it. And one of the great things about this system was the redesigned dog bone controller. But over time, these may wear out and you may have issues with them. You may need to repair them, and that is what we're gonna to try to do here today. Hey everyone, Gary here with Rocksaw Productions. Thanks for stopping by and checking out what we have going on here. Do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button and that subscribe button, that way every time we upload new content, you're kept the most informed and up to date. And what I wanna know from you here today is the Dogbone controller is absolutely just one of my favorite controllers of all time. But I still really like the original NES controller. Which is your favorite between the two of them? the original Square NES controller or the Dogbone controller. Now, on a recent trip to one of our local stores, I did see this guy here. This is the Retro 8 from Retrobit. This is not a new release from them. This is something they've had out for some time and other manufacturers also make knockoff or clones of this Dogbone controller. See, this controller here is actually the one that came with my system. And, well, I've had some issues with it. It just doesn't work right. Button presses don't respond correctly. Um, it, when I press up or down in a button, sometimes it pauses randomly. It just does weird things. I also have a nick out of the controller cord too. It's the way it came when I got my system. So what I'm gonna try to do in this episode, it's probably not gonna work, but I still wanted to try it. And also I wanted to give this, you know, the Retro 8 controller a try too, is I wanted to see, can I pull the membranes out of that and put it in this and possibly resurrect this controller. At the same time, I've actually never checked this controller out either. So we're gonna give it a once over as well. Let's go ahead, let's hit the bench. Let's see, can I fix it? So let's go ahead and dive into our repair here. As you can see, I only paid $10 for this pretty inexpensive. So it's one of those, if it works great, if not, I'm not out a whole lot of money. Let's go ahead and pop open the box and it looks like there's a couple pieces of tape on either side of the flap. So we'll go ahead and just cut through that. I don't have my X-Acto knife handy, so I'm just gonna use a pair of tweezers because why not? So here you can see out of the packaging, it actually really resembles what a dog bone controller from Nintendo would look like. One of the major things though, look how much thinner the cable is here between the controller and the system. This is really a thin gauge wire that may cause some issues, but overall let's take a look at the back of the controllers and they look virtually identical. I mean, it's really remarkable how close Retrobit got on the overall shape and design. This does have an extra screw underneath that little security thing. Testing out the D-pad here, it definitely feels like it's got a lot of travel to it. The B and A also, same thing. Comparing it to the original, the original just feels so much better than what this does. I mean, just being quite honest with you about that. To get inside of the Retro 8 controller, we're gonna need a Phillips blade screwdriver and I've just got my little electric handy dandy one here that I've been using a lot lately. Comes in very handy, in fact. And for about 10 bucks, you really can't go wrong. We got two of them out, there's three, there's number four, and like I mentioned, number five is underneath that little security sticker right there too, or the, uh, the QC sticker. It pops apart pretty easily, and as you can see, there's not much to this board, and in fact, the wires are actually soldered directly to the board itself versus using any kind of a wiring harness. Now let's go ahead and take apart the real deal because, well, I'm not sure that this is gonna work. I'm really not sure that this is gonna work. Now the screws on the original controller are pretty dirty here, so I might soak them in some alcohol or some contact cleaner just to kind of get the, the crud off of them. The nice thing about this little electric screwdriver too is the little headlight that you see that it has on it too. Just makes it really easy to see what I'm working on. And with screw number five out, we'll pop this open. This thing is grody, I will tell you that much. 
I've only used it a couple of times. And here you can see inside the differences between the board. First and foremost, you do have a Molex connector here where the wiring goes into the back of the board. You also have a little integrated circuit on the upper left hand just next to the cable itself. Now looking at the membrane and everything, it's stuck to the board. I'm not sure that this is gonna work. I mean, especially looking here at the buttons and whatnot, the membranes for start and select, those are definitely different where this is a solid piece versus the, um, the Retro 8 uses two separate buttons. The D-pad itself pops right out as do the A and the B buttons. You know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a little bit of alcohol and I'm just gonna clean the inside of this case as well because like I mentioned, she be grody. So I've kind of cleaned out the inside of the original controller. You can see the cotton swabs here, all the crap that I pulled out of there. I mean, that's that was really disgusting. So uh, we're gonna set that aside. We've also wiped everything down with some paper towels just to make sure that we have everything clean. Now looking here again, the start and select buttons are a single button versus on this, they're two separate buttons. I don't think that this is gonna work. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna put the stock start and select back in here. And we're gonna drop our stock buttons back in here because I don't think those are going to work either. Overall, I think the uh, the Retro 8 is gonna be kind of a miss. I do wanna just check and see if these will fit in and no, uh, the way that they're indexed, they, the, the little tabs that line up with the, uh, the holes on the sides, they just, they won't fit. Let's check and see if I can even get just the membranes on the back. Uh, it's probably insane to think the membrane would work. Insane in the brain! The, the outer diameter of that is just too large compared to the inner diameter of the hole on the button. So what we're gonna have to do is try to clean our existing membranes and see if that fixes the issues we're having. I, I don't think that this is gonna work at all for us. Maybe we can still use the D-pad. Let's, let's check that out. But here, like I say, you can see the difference in the, uh, the diameter of the holes on the buttons itself. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some cotton swabs, a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, and our paper towels. We're just gonna put some IPA on these, get them nice and soaked, and kind of work them around both the front and the back on our paper towel here. Just, again, I'm hoping against hope. The, the weird things that I was having going on with this controller, I, I, I don't think this is gonna work. With everything dried off, we've got the buttons back in place. We're gonna put the membrane back in place. Now we're gonna double check the D-pad because yeah, we're, we're gonna clean this too because it's filthy. Same basic thing here. We've just got some of the IPA left over from what we were cleaning the membrane, but we'll still squirt a little bit on here to try to get that extra, extra little bit of cleanliness on here because this is, eesh. And no, this is not my fault. I bought it like this, and because it hasn't been working, I honestly have had it sitting in a drawer for probably close to two years. This is actually the controller that was with my, um, my top loader when I bought it and I did the HDMI mod. Using the uh, cotton swab, I'm just trying to get in the corners here to get the extra little bit of dirt and crud out of there. I wonder if even just the membrane for the D-pad would work. We're gonna peel that off here and see it just doesn't, yeah. I mean, the outsides look very similar, but the inside's completely different, which is unfortunate. I do wish that there was a way that I could still get my hands on these replacement gels and the membranes and everything. They're just, it's impossible to get a hold of right now. All right, so we're gonna pop that out. Let's see if we can use the, the Retrobit D-pad if that'll work. So we've got the D-pad out of the Retro 8. Let's check and see. Yeah, this, this feels like it's, yeah, it's not even close to the same size. And the way that that membrane is held in, not even close. This is, uh, goodness. Well, I mean, at least all the components inside the controller are gonna be clean. I mean, that's, that's the best we can say about that. Not all of our repairs will go exactly as planned. So let's go ahead and get the membrane back on the back of the D-pad. It will only go on one way properly, but before we put it on there, same thing we did with the start and select and with the AB membranes. We're just gonna try to clean the gunk off of here to see if there's any way that we can kind of resurrect what this controller should be doing. I'm getting a decent amount of dirt off of here, so maybe? 
Uh, I don't know, but maybe. Look at all that. I mean, it looks literally like brown dirt coming off on the uh, on the paper towel here. All right, dry it off and whatnot, and let's go ahead and reinstall it as I hit the tripod yet again. Now I gotta remember which way did that go in here. All right, that looks about right. Kind of get it seated so it, it does everything that it needs to. Maybe, do I gotta flip this around? Because it wasn't quite seating quite right. Ah, there we go. It needs to go on the little post. There we go, we got that on there now. Now let's go and reinstall the board back into the controller shell itself. Oop. Flip it around. Get everything lined up between the board and the posts. And then we'll get the cable back down. Exiting out of the controller top properly. Now at this point we're going to put the back back on. And then most of the screws, I think, yep, looks like all the screws stayed in place. So what we're going to do, unscrew slightly, get the screw set, and then tighten the rest down. Now, one nice thing about this little electric screwdriver, it doesn't have a whole lot of torque, so I don't have to worry about it stripping out holes of plastics and whatnot. It, it does a decent job for what it is, and I don't really have to worry about it too, too much. And we're just going to go back through and tighten everything down by hand. Uh, we are using kind of a, a star pattern, a crisscross pattern here to make sure that everything goes back together as smoothly as possible. Now let's get the Retro 8 back together because quite honestly, this, well, it's not exactly what stock was. It may actually not be a terrible controller. We'll get the, uh, the buttons do go in in a specific direction. One side is wider than the other as far as the, the indexing tabs. Drop those in, get the little membrane back on, start and select. They can go either way, doesn't really matter a whole lot. Get our membrane back on for the D-pad itself. And the difference here, if you look at the way the membrane fits over the, the housing, it, it's just retained completely differently. And now we'll go ahead and get the PCB back in here. It is definitely a challenge compared to what the original NES uh, D-pad was. Come on, you sit on there properly. And there's a couple tabs to hold the board in place as well. We'll get the wire back in place here. So it does kind of snake around the top of the controller, but since it's such a thin diameter wire and insulation, it doesn't really want to stay in place, which is a bummer. I have to carefully get the wires back in here so they don't get pinched or severed or anything along those lines, because quite honestly, this may still be a viable, like, Player 2 controller or something along those lines. Line up the case halves, snap it together and get the elbow into the tripod again because I'm a moron. Unscrew it slightly, screw it back in. We're going to tighten these down the exact same way that we did the, uh, the real deal here. I'm sorry for the super dry hands, winter time, what can I say? Alright, now that we have both controllers back together and whatnot, Let's see if we were actually able, like, if a cleaning was able to do what we needed it to do so that the original Dogbone controller works, and we might even take this Retro 8 for a test spin. It's okay. I mean, the shape of the casing and everything feels all right, but, yeah, I just feel like there's too much downward travel in the D-pad. The A and B buttons are okay. The overall case actually feels really, really good. You know, compared to the travel here on the real deal, it doesn't have as much up and down travel in the casing itself. This is just a beautiful design. Nintendo, re-release these, please! So I will openly admit that for 10 bucks, this was a risk I was willing to take. I didn't think that the parts would transfer over, but again, for 10 bucks, it was worth the shot. So we do have our cleaned dog bone controller here. Now, one thing I did find on the wire here somewhere, and I got a feel for it, is the fact it's like there's dog's teeth or something that have marked up the cable. Um, I can't find it right now, but so there may be more going on here than just dirt inside the controller. Let's go ahead and test out Metal Storm. Now, one of the things out of the box is some of the controls are not what you might expect. So, for example, you can go up, and it paused the game there, that's not a good sign, to the ceiling, and to do that, you press down and jump. And to come down, you press up and jump. Not intuitive. But if you press select, start, start, now your controls should be as you would want them. So, yep, and it's pausing again, which is not a good sign. You know what, let's turn this up, 
so we can hear a little bit too. Such a great game. I'm so glad that Retrobit was able to work with iRream to re-release this. So for standard just platforming and whatnot, it seems like it's okay. It's when I'm flipping that I was doing that occasional pause and now it's that there, it just did it again. Um, so didn't fix our issue. There's something more going on here than just a dirty controller. But let's do this. Since we have it here, let's see how the Retro 8 works. I mean, it's it's definitely not a new design from Retrobit. This is something they've had for a number of years. Um, and I will say it is not, it doesn't feel as good in the hands as the regular dog bone controller does simply because it is so lightweight. I also think that there's way too much travel on the D-pad, but let's see how it plays because it's actually really comfortable. So select, start, start. That's working just fine. I remember reading about this in Nintendo Power and this was like around the time that Mech Warrior, or as I was looking at the camera, I didn't see the enemy coming. So at the same time, Mech Warrior became really, really big too. Um, it, it's after Macross was really a thing, after Jetfire, Skyfire was in the Transformers. So definitely something that I never had during the original release, but it's a terrific game. And when I'm actually looking at the screen with the Retro 8 controller, it actually is playing really well too. I can't complain about it. It's just really lightweight in the hand. So uh, going back to the original controller, one of the things I may look at doing is seeing if there's a way, and we're going to reset this, uh, seeing if there's a way that I can find a controller out there that I can pull the guts out of, say that the casing is not in great shape, but you know, the uh, buttons are, the D-pad are, um, and the cord is. I may take that and transfer the guts into this one. 8-Bit Doe, well, I'm not a fan of them because they don't respond to inquiries via social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. They don't respond to emails. I've never had any luck communicating with them. But they do still offer, at least I've seen online, a wireless retrofit kit that you can go ahead and install a new board into the dog bone controller and then they have their retro dongle or their retro receiver as they call it and then you can go ahead and use it wirelessly. I'd rather not do that, I'd rather have it wired, um, but I've got some options that I am looking at. Now, if you do want to see like our full-blown unboxing and review of Metal Storm, how we HDMI modded our top loader NES, and more content, those videos are coming up for you right now. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you want to help support Rock Solid Productions and be a part of our community, there's a number of different ways you can do so. First and foremost, join us over on our Patreon page or become a channel member here on YouTube. By joining through either one of those methods, you get early access to just about all of our video content, exclusive content, and a whole lot more. We also give you shout outs at the end of each and every one of our videos. You can also pick up some awesome Rock Solid Productions swag. We've got t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, and more available through our Teespring store on screen right now too. You can also pick up some of our awesome 3D printed cartridge stands, Amiibo holders, Nintendo DS holders, and more by visiting our 3D printer store on screen right now as well. Links for everything will be down below in a pinned comment. If you want to stay up to date with everything we have going on here at Rock Solid Productions, make sure that you're following us on the different social media networks. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Productions, Instagram at instagram.com slash Productions GK, and Twitter at Rock Solid Studios. If you're looking to pick this and other retro and modern gaming accessories up, make sure that you head on over to CastlemaniaGames.com. He has a feature over there called Castle Cash, where the more you spend, the more you earn towards future purchases, and Castle Cash is just like cash. He also offers convenient payment plans for more expensive items over $50. Finally, make sure that you use promo code ROCKSOLID10 when you're shopping at CastlemaniaGames.com as it can save you up to 10% on most items on the website. Again, thank you for watching this episode and I cannot wait to see you again soon.